I now call to order the Society's 2,392nd meeting in the 148th year since its founding in 1871. Good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Milstein. I'm the president of PSW, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members and guests to tonight's lecture by Yuval Grossman in the John Wesley Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C., including our members and friends around the world who are watching the live stream of tonight's meeting on PSW Science's YouTube channel. We'll begin with a few announcements, a reading of the minutes of the 2,391st meeting and Don Norman's lecture on democratizing design, and then turn to this evening's lecture, followed by a question and answer period. Thereafter, I will present a small thank you gift to our speaker, make a few closing announcements, and adjourn the meeting to the social hour. Please join me in thanking uh, the sponsors of the fall 2017 and spring 2018 lecture series, the Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University, and a generous sponsor who has asked not to be named. I'm pleased to announce that tonight's speaker, Yuval Grossman, has been elected to the society. And please join me in welcoming him. Welcome. <laughs> Recording Secretary James Heelan will now read the minutes of Don Norman's lecture at the 2,391st meeting. James, the podium is yours. Thank you. Good evening. April 6, 2018, President Larry Milstein called the 2,391st meeting of the Society to order at 8.04 p.m. in the John Wesley Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C. He announced the order of business, that the evening's lecture would be live streamed on the internet, and welcomed new members to the Society. The minutes of the previous meeting and the lecture by Andrew Knoll were approved without correction. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, Don Norman, director of the design lab at the University of California, San Diego. His lecture was titled, Democratizing Design, Providing Knowledge and Tools to Everyone. The design lab approaches complex socio-technical problems as systems with no single cause or solution. Distinguishing the design lab from traditional academia, Norman said that rather than attempting to identify pure truths, his team focuses on solutions that are good enough to make a difference. While there is active disagreement among scientists about the details, Norman said there is often scientific consensus on the big issues. He believes the points of general agreement are good enough to begin taking action. Norman also believes the communities affected by big problems are the best resource for solving those problems. For example, he said, in Phoenix, Arizona, the city initially offered multiple transit solutions presented as competing proposals. Rather than present an expert opinion to sway decision makers into one direction, Norman's colleague presented them with a construct demonstrating that the city budget could allow for a compromise solution. The city itself thus produced its own comprehensive transit plan that Norman contends would have otherwise been rejected if presented by an outside expert. Norman also advocated using modern technology to crowdsource solutions. As example, Norman told the story of families of diabetics across the country who used open source software to connect and to develop an integrated blood sugar monitor and insulin pump. Norman said this process legally bypassed FDA regulations and came up with a solution that the commercial industry would not have done on its own in the same time. Norman concluded by proposing democratized education. He said that learning through attempting to solve complex problems is more effective than single subject lecture-based learning. In so doing, Norman said that people can teach themselves. President Milstein then invited questions from the audience. A guest asked whether Norman had considered prize-based development. Norman responded that prizes are an effective tool to dramatically advance solutions, citing DARPA and the X Prize as examples. After the question and answer period, 
President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. At 9.21 p.m., President Milstein adjourned the 2,391st meeting of the society to the social hour. Temperature, 19 degrees C. Weather, partly cloudy. And attendance, 117. Respectfully submitted, James Heelan, Recording Secretary. Thank you, James. Are there any corrections to the minutes? I heard from somebody who had difficulty getting online to the live feed, and if we have reason to believe that's anything but an isolated issue. Excuse me, this is not about that. This is about the minutes. I was just curious if that might be something for the minutes. Ah, no, I don't think so. But <laughs> I'd rather not have it reported in the minutes, so all of the trouble that we've had with the live stream. Is anybody in here who's an extrovert on streaming? I guess not. In any case, are there any comments on the minutes besides that? If not, I will entertain a motion from a member to accept the minutes. I have three motions. Do I have a second? I have three seconds. Four, five, six, seven. <laughs> okay, I think we, all members in favor of accepting the minutes as read, please say aye. aye. All those who are opposed, the minutes are unanimously accepted as read and will be posted without correction or comment to the PSW website in due course. I think we can move on. And we now turn to tonight's lecture on antimatter, or more precisely, why there isn't any. And it's my pleasure to briefly introduce tonight's speaker, Yuval Grossman. Yuval is a professor of physics at Cornell University his research concentrates on issues related to fundamental open questions in theoretical physics, including and especially neutrino physics, dark matter, and the subjects of tonight's lecture, antimatter. I'm very happy to announce, coincidentally, that yesterday Yuval was awarded the Alexander von Humboldt Prize in Physics for career achievement. So I think we should all give him a special... Before moving to Cornell, Yuval was a professor at the Technion in Israel, a visiting professor at Harvard, Boston University, and at the Weizmann Institute of Science. He was a research associate at Stanford, where he was an office mate, an office mate of Nima Arkani Hamid, who gave a lecture here not long ago, and whose video of that lecture has been viewed by over 40,000 viewers, or more precisely, he's had over 40,000 views. Yuval earned his PhD at the Weizmann Institute of Science. Please hold questions for the question and answer period at the end of the lecture and join me in welcoming Yuval to the podium. Ready? Can you hear me? Good. At exactly 8.19.53, you all started his talk. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Never seen something like this before. OK, thank you very much for having me. And today's lecture, I'm going to talk about something that actually I spent a lot of my research on. And that's the question of uh, <coughs> where are the antimatter? And I already introduced Mark one new words called biogenesis, and we're going to discuss actually what it is. So let me start by saying that biogenesis is an open question in physics. And I want to actually first kind of discuss what, does it, what do I mean by I say that it's an open question of physics? What does it mean that I have an open question in physics, which usually is very different than open question in mathematics? So I guess you maybe heard about the fact that they Fermi's last theorem was a very long time an open question in mathematics. So in mathematics, when we have an open question, it means we just don't know how to prove something. We just don't know. In physics, usually the situation is actually the other way around. We have a question, and we have actually more than one possible solution. And we don't know which is the correct solution. Maybe none of the solution that we are pretending, is the, what we are thinking about, is the correct solution. But usually, we have actually quite a lot of solutions. 
And the problem that I'm going to describe to you today, the open question that I'm going to describe to you today, is actually a question in the following sense that we have a theory, and this theory is a very, very successful theory, and there's one experimental result that this theory cannot reproduce. Okay? When I say I have a good theory, that means that the theory reproduces what I see in experiment. And this one today question is this one that I cannot actually explain within the theory. So it's an open question in a sense that I know there's something else, and there's actually many, many possibilities to solve this idea, and we don't know which one is the correct one. So before I go into the talk, let me kind of tell you what we are as with what I do in physics and what we call is high energy physics. And high energy physics is actually also talking about very, very small distance physics, things that go at a very, very small distance. And what we are trying to do, we try to actually understand the very fundamental laws of physics, which is different than other parts of physics, which other parts of physics take the fundamental law of physics and say how from those fundamental laws of physics we can actually get very, very interesting phenomena coming out of the laws of physics, okay? Or if you, for example, <clears throat> when you're doing engineering, you say, yes, I take the law of physics as I know them and I apply them to try to do things that I understand in everyday life. What we try to understand is actually try to understand the very, very fundamental law of physics, okay? That's the idea of what we are doing, okay? And as of now, we understand physics basically at distances of order roughly 10 to the minus 20 centimeter, which is, <coughs> if we think about our, if you think about the atom size, an atom size is 10 order of magnitude smaller than our side. And we understand physics, which is 10 order of magnitude smaller than the size of the atom. So we understand physics at a very, very, very short distance. However, <coughs> We actually believe that there's much more. We, so we, know, none of us that do high energy physics claim that yes, we understand physics, that's it, it's done, that's all. You know, we say there's actually much, much more to understand. So the theory that we, it's a very successful theory, come under the very kind of almost boring name of the standard model. The standard model, it sounds like a model, it's not really a theory, but it's no, it's just, it's just the name is just wrong. I don't know who gave it the name. Maybe back then people didn't know about, you know, how important our name and PR and branding and all this. We should rebrand it. It's not the standard model. It's the theory of nature. Sounds better, right? Yes, the theory of nature. And this theory of nature is actually explain a huge number of phenomena. Okay, and today in the talk I'm going to tell you actually quite a few that it's understand that it's far from trivial. And it's explained a lot, a lot, a lot of them. Okay? But there's actually reasons to believe that this is not the end of the story. And that's the thing that we saw in physics all of our life, okay? When Newton came with Newton law, everybody knew, wow, that is really, really nice and a very nice theory. But then we understand there's something deeper than Newton laws, okay? And Einstein came and said, yes, there's something deeper, it's relativity. And then quantum mechanics came and we understand, yes, there's something deep, deeper. And that's really the way... I, I like to think about doing physics. I'm not asking what is the full theory of nature. I'm just trying about how to... <laughs> Problems? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so I like to think about physics is every time we just go one step and understand something a little deeper into what, uh, what we are. And this open question and the one that I'm going to talk to you about today are our hints into really understand something a little deeper of where we are. And there's not many open questions. So whenever we have an open question, we kind of cherish the fact that we don't understand. We are not saying, oh my God, I don't understand. It's the other way around. Like, yes, there's something I don't understand. That's my little, little opening to the unknown world. Okay? So we are actually exciting about this. So after this kind of short introduction of what I'm doing, it's general what is physics, let me go and ask what is antimatter. So before I ask what is antimatter, let me actually define what is matter, so we can actually define the anti of it. And that's probably something that I guess all of you saw somewhere in high school, okay? That's kind of how the atom is, is built, and it's built out of those kind of particles. There's the nucleus, and the nucleus made up of proton and neutron, and sometimes out there there's the electron, and you kind of say, oh, they kind of go out there. And all those are what we call matter. That's what everything is made out, basically, Everything that we are here made out of those particles, proton, neutron, and electron, that's all the matter that we see around us. Very, very simple and naive definition that it's actually correct, okay? And let me give you some more words. And many times when you sound this kind of a very fancy word, like a baryon, it sounds so fancy, but let me just tell you, so you don't really worry about this. 
A baryon is just a generic name for the proton and the neutron, okay? Just called baryon. A lepton is another generic name basically for the electron and some other particle that we call a neutrino, okay? And there's also another particle that is called the photon, which is basically light, okay? And I'm not going to get into the full details of why light are particles. Maybe some of you heard it, probably most of you know about it. So these are some names that we are using. Okay? So we know what matter is. The way we define matter is basically everything that around us, we call it matter. Okay? What is antimatter? So it's turned out that each particle that has a charge, electric charge, comes also with another particle that's called the antiparticle. Okay? And this antiparticle has exactly the same mass of the particle. So if I have an electron, the anti-electron has exactly the same mass. However, it has also exactly the opposite charge. So if the electron has a charge which we call minus one, you can call it some minus of some number, but we can call it minus one, then the charge of the antiparticle is plus one. And if the proton has a charge of plus one, then the antiproton has a charge of minus one. And actually there's few other properties, and all the properties of those particles are either exactly the same or exactly opposite. Okay? So all the charges are the, <coughs> all the things are the same or the same. And again, some names, the anti-electron, also known as the positron, and the anti-proton, it's called the anti-proton, there's no name for it. The anti-neutron, it's called the anti-neutron. You may be a little bit confused because I said every charge particle, so how come a neutron can be an anti-neutron if the neutron has zero charge, okay? And the answer is that actually the neutron is made out of something that we call quarks, and quarks have charge. So what we really change, we change the charge of the quarks inside the neutron. So it's only a particle that is fundamentally, fundamentally doesn't have a charge, doesn't have an antiparticle. And for example, the photon, which is just light, light has no charge, and the photon has no antiparticle, or the way we like to say it is the photon is the antiparticle of itself. Some particles have an antiparticle, and some particles just say we are our own antiparticle. Good. <clears throat> so let me tell you a little bit about the history of antiparticle and how we find antimatter. And this gentleman, his name is uh, Paul Dirac, and he was a British physicist, a very interesting physicist, and how I would say it. Um, I'm not surprised that you know, many physicists have very interesting life. The way I like to say it, I'm the only normal physicist, but <laughs> which is of course. Uh, <coughs> so Paul Dirac was a very, very interesting person, an extremely quiet person, and the story was that his father was a French teacher, and he told him, you have to, f to talk French. And he didn't know French, so he was just not talking at all. So <coughs> he was extremely bright. And the more I'm learning and the more I do research, I just see that Dirac, he did so, so, so many things across the board. And some of his kind of less known than other very, very big names in physics, but although he did a lot, a lot of things. So the story was that quantum mechanics, so at the beginning of the, of the 20th century, there was two big revolutions in physics. One of them was the discovery of relativity, and the other was the discovery of quantum mechanics. And when we, people discover <coughs> um, quantum mechanics, that was about 20 years after relativity, and they couldn't actually put the two things together. So you can have quantum mechanics that works without relativity, and you have relativity that works without quantum mechanics. And people were unable to put the two together. And it took not very long, okay, it took about three years or four years for Dirac, since Heisenberg wrote and Schrodinger wrote the expression of quantum mechanics, to actually to be able to combine the two together. Okay? And when he put this together, he wrote the very famous Dirac equation, and then he was trying to solve the Dirac equation, and he said the Dirac equation was putting meta and, uh, quantum mechanics and relativity together. And what he found out, he found that his equation that actually explained a lot of things that was already unexplained, it had a very, very weird prediction. So the equation kind of explained the electron, and the electron has a negative charge. At the same time, it predicts another particle with a positive charge. So in the beginning, Dirac was very happy. He said, wow, that's great. I thought I want to explain the electron. I also have the proton, because the proton has a charge which is opposite than the charge of the electron. However, the prediction of the, of, the, of the equation was that the mass of the electron, of the 
negatively charged particle is exactly the same as the mass of the positive one. And we know that the mass of the proton is about roughly 2,000 more the mass of the electron. And Dirac was very confused about this. And for two years, he didn't believe his own equation. He said, my equation predicts a new particle. And this new particle has to be exactly the same mass of the electron, but I don't see it. I know that the mass, that the, char the particles have mass, they have, sorry, the particles have a <coughs> charge, which is opposite that of the electron, have a mass which is 2,000 larger than the mass of the electron. Okay? So for two years, he refused to believe it. Those days, now when I do it, Every day I invent five particles. Okay, none of them are actually real. We didn't find them. But today we actually all the time pre oh, there's more particles. But back then it was a big deal. After about two years, Dirac said, you know, I have to believe my theory. The theory explained. My theory actually make a prediction. My theory make a prediction that there's a new particle, and this particle must have exactly the same mass and opposite charge than that of the electron. Okay? And that's kind of this little picture that I put here. What Dirac was saying is that I have a particle that I say it's a mirror image of the electron. So I have the electron and I have the mirror image of the electron. That was the prediction. Dirac was very confused. He said, if there is this particle, why we don't see it? He knew about the electron, but he didn't know about the positron. So that's become a, an experimental challenge. And again, it was very, very quick in physics times. It took basically four years from the day he put us the equation in 1928 until Carl Anderson, who was actually a postdoc at Caltech back then, find this particle, and that's the picture of the first discovery of the anti-electron. I want to explain to you what I actually see it. So one thing that I want to tell you or remind you, that if I have a particle with charge and I put it in a magnetic field, and it's travel, it's travel in a curve. Okay? And the curve has to do with how fast or how, how much energy this particle has. The more energy the particle has, it's go with a bigger radius, with a, little, with a smallest curve. Okay? So what people found, they found curves. And there was a big question. The question is, if I see a particle that goes like this, it can be either a positive particle coming from here or a negative coming, particle coming from above. So the question, how can I actually tell the absolute if this particle is an electron with a negative charge, a regular electron, or a, a charge with a positive charge, okay? So Anderson had this really, really nice idea, and he said, let me put here a metal. And when the particle cross the metal, the particle must lose energy. When the particle lose energy, the curve become bigger, so I know the direction. So if you look here, which part the particle come from and which the part going, so it's clear here, very little curve, and here there's much bigger curvature. So we know in this picture that actually the particle came from below. Okay? And knowing the magnetic field, that was the first time that we actually saw that there's a positively charged electron, now called the positron. And where this positron actually came from? From heaven. <laughs> yes, you got the Nobel Prize because heaven sent you some particles for you. So, <coughs> this particle actually comes from cosmic rays. So we know that the Earth is all the time bomb bombarded by particles, and this particle creates a lot, a lot of other particles, and that was the era that people start to actually study those cosmic rays, just come from, from the sky, and those cosmic rays actually have a lot, a lot of those positrons, and by this really cool idea of putting this thing, Anderson was able to actually observe the first antiparticle. So Dirac was predicting it, four years forward, we actually found antimatter. Where are we today in antimatter? So antimatter, you know, it's been quite a lot, and we understand much matter about antimatter today. One thing we know about antimatter is that when I have an electron that meets a positron, they what we call annihilate. They basically become pure energy, or they become what we call gamma rays. They just produce a pure energy. And we don't see the antimatter around us unless it's actually come and it's lived short until it's meet a matter, okay? So an antiparticle can go, and then it's hit a matter, it's annihilate. Where do we see them? We see them in cosmic rays all the time, okay? As we speak right now, I guarantee that as you speak on each of you, there's some antiparticles coming from the sky right now, okay? Don't, don't you know, it's okay, it's okay. But yes, that's happened. Right now, antiparticles come from the sky. We see antiparticles in colliders. We see them, we study many, many of them. We study huge amount of the, of the details in collider. We know how to produce them. We just see them. 
We see them in uh, uh, <coughs> nuclear reactions, okay? We see them in um, uh, actually any radioactive decay can produce an antiparticle, okay? A banana produces a positron, one positron per hour, okay? So your body also produces positrons because you ate some bananas, even if not bananas, okay? Actually, anything that has calcium produced, so our body produces naturally positrons, okay? And again, our body produces about one or two, a few positrons per hour, depending on your diet, okay? And actually, it's become a real practical tool, okay? And this machine here, it's a PET scan, and it's used to help with the cancer diagnostic. And the idea of this PET scan machine is the name PET stands for positron electron tomography. And the idea is that <coughs> if someone has cancer and the doctor likes to find where the cancer cells are, you give the patient uh, some uh, radioactive sugar and sugar tends to go to where cancerous cells are. And then when the radioactive sugar emit a positron, the positron immediately find an electron and they annihilate into gamma rays. And what this machine is, is basically just a detector of gamma rays. And then you see the two gamma rays coming out from the electron positron and you know, you just see where they're coming and then you trace them back and you see where you are. And what you see is that the area where you have a lot, a lot of emission, that's where you see the cancerous cell, okay? So this thing that looks completely theoretical less than 100 years ago become very practical, and in any major hospitals those days, you find this thing that works on, on antimatter. And the very last uh, kind of advances in antimatter is the fact that recently we were able, not we as a community, we were able to produce even anti-hydrogen. So it's the first atom that we were able to use. Before I was telling you about anti-electron or anti-proton, and now we're able to produce an anti-hydrogen, and we measure the property of the anti-hydrogen, and of course, as I told you, that's the mirror image. We've had the same mass, the same energy. All the properties are mirror image of each other. Okay, good. So now we kind of know what antimatter is, and now the question, where is it? And the question is basic, very simple. I just told you that the Dirac equation and everything we measured basically tells me that matter and antimatter are exact mirror image of each other, okay? So if I can turn an electron and a proton and make hydrogen, and then I can take four hydrogens and, you know, and take two neutrons, I can make helium, and I can make carbon, and I can make uh, iron, and from the carbon I can make uh, chemistry, and I can make biology, and I can make people, and I can make everything out of matter. If there's an, a mirror image, I should be able to actually create everything from antimatter as well. If two things are exactly the same, you should see the same number of them. It's as simple as this, okay? So if they are the same, we should see the same, and then you look around you, okay? Take a moment to look around you, look for the antimatter. No, you just don't see it. Everything around us is matter. So that's the open question. That's the big open question, okay? <clears throat> so where's the antimatter? So here are some ideas that I could come with, and actually it's a little bit unfair, not me, but the community came up with some solutions. And here are some answers, possible answers, like a multiple choice, okay? Um, one possible answer is say, you know, that's how it is, that's how the universe was created. You know, you come, you come to the, you know, you arrive to the world, and here is the world with just matter, okay? So matter and antimatter are the same, but it just started with a little bit of an asymmetry, what can we do, okay? We know that this is wrong, and the reason that we know that this is wrong is that we understand a lot about cosmology, and we know that the way the universe was started, it started in a Big Bang, and after a Big Bang, there was what we call a period of inflation, and the period of inflation kind of washed away everything that was there before, and you start from scratch. It's really nice, this idea of inflation, okay? Okay, governments sometimes use it because they want to erase all the money of their citizens, but, you know, if you are not, but that's the idea. You erase everything and start from scratch, okay? So if you erase everything and start to stretch, in a way, you don't care. Like, you know, when I grew up in Israel, there was this 400 and something percent per year, okay? And I remember as a kid, I have this little, well, in Israel, you don't put 
piggy bank because, you know, pig is not good for the Jewish. But you put whatever, there was some other animal, and I put my money in, okay? And years later, I asked my mom, so where is it? And she said, it was inflated away, okay? Can the government <laughs> took care of all my sales. That's what happened to the universe. You don't care what you had before. So even if the universe somehow starts with more matter than antimatter, it was inflated away, and we have something that starts completely, that was actually completely from scratch. So that cannot be the solution. Another solution is maybe it's separated, okay? Actually, we live here on matter, but maybe there's some other parts of the universe where all the antimatter is there. So there's still the same amount. It just somehow, here is the matter, and here's the antimatter, okay? And this is also wrong. And it's wrong for several reasons. One reason is that experimentally, if this here matter and here antimatter, we're going to see when they meet. They're going to meet, they're going to emit gamma rays. We look, we didn't see it. But there's actually a, another way to think why it's not this. It's just standard standard what's called thermodynamics. Okay? Thermodynamics tell us that when you have things, the things tend to actually mix. Okay? And let me give you an example. There's actually some probability that as we talk, okay, in this room there's about 20% oxygen and 80% nitrogen. Okay? There is actually a probability that this part, this 20% part will be full of oxygen and this 80% part will be full of nitrogen. Okay? It would be very, really bad because I will be the only one, the only survivor, <laughs> right? <laughs> but why none of us worried about this? I mean, did anybody, when you came here, like you were worried about this situation, that somehow you would sit in the nitrogen only? No, why? Because you trust thermodynamics. Thermodynamics tell us that things are going to mix. So there's no fundamental reason for the matter and the antimatter actually to separate, just like there's no reason for the oxygen and the nitrogen to actually separate it. So we know that this is actually not the, the right answer. So maybe, another answer, and maybe it's around us. We just don't see it. There's some antimatter in the form of Let's call it dark matter, something that we don't see. So we have matter, which is the proton and the electron and the neutron. And we have antimatter, which is not antiproton, but some other kind of antimatter. Okay? And this is probably actually correct. We actually think, we are not sure, that the neutrino that fill up the universe, there might be more antineutrinos than neutrinos that fill up the universe, and maybe the total amount of matter in the universe is actually zero, but we have more proton than antiproton, and we have more antineutrinos than neutrinos. And as I said, we don't really sure, but it might be a possibility. And if this is the correct possibility, I want to change my question, you know? <laughs> so I want to ask not why there's more matter than antimatter. I want to ask the question why there's more baryons. And you remember I told you this weird word in the beginning, but I said I will use it a lot. So baryon is basically just proton and neutron. So why there's more proton and neutron than antiproton and antineutron? So that's really the question I want to ask. So I keep going to say yes, why there's more matter than antimatter, but I want to be a little more delicate and say that's really the question I'm asking. Okay? And then there's a fourth possibility. And the fourth possibility is that actually matter and antimatter are not exactly the same. So I'm making the assumption that they are mirror image. Because I told you Dirac found it, ta-ta-ta. But maybe that's not the full story. Maybe there is actually a little difference between matter and antimatter, and they're not exactly the same. And then the universe starts with the same amount, and when the universe was kind of a baby universe and expand into, at some point during the evolution of the universe, the matter took over, and the universe became much more matter than antimatter. And just because it's a multiple choice, and I say no for the other three, you know that this is the correct answer. It's correct in the sense that we all believe that this is the correct answer. We are not really 100% sure, but we have a lot, a lot of reasons to believe that this is the correct answer. So, what do we conclude? We conclude that matter and antimatter are not exact mirror image of each other. So I told you they are, they have the same mass, the same charge, the same everything, but there must be something different, which we don't know what it is. And we know there must be something different. Okay, see how we kind of learn things. Even if we don't know what it is, we learn something. And it was, the matter was created in the early universe. So sometime during the evolution of the universe, matter was created. So that brings us more questions. And that's, again, something that we see a lot in physics. When you solve one question, it brings you other questions. Okay? So we understand, wow, that's cool. 
universe was, the matter and antimatter are not exactly the same. So in what ways they are not exactly the same? Okay? I was telling you they have the same mass, the same charge, just opposite in sign. In what ways are really not the same? And then how the matter was created? I say, oh, it's sometimes in the early universe it was created, but how? I mean, what was this? I mean, was Harry Potter came and said, boom? Or there was something a little bigger than this, okay? And when that happened? I was telling you, oh, it's sometimes in the early universe. Can you tell me when? Was it happened when the universe was, you know, 70 years old, maybe 7 million, maybe 10 to the minus 5 seconds? So the, these are the new questions that I'm about to answer, about to give you some answers. So let me start with the question, when was matter created? And in order to answer this question, I'm going to actually tell you some questions that are not open questions, they are actually solved questions in physics that will lead us to the question, answer when matter was created, which we actually have a good idea. So let me ask a different question. There's many different elements around us, okay? And you may ask where those elements were created. I mean, a very interesting question is why gold is expensive, okay? <laughs> well, of course, I know. Well, gold is expensive because it's rare. So why gold is much rarer, much more rare than iron, for example, okay? What is the reason, okay? Why there's different isotopes, okay? Why most of the carbon that we have in our body is carbon-12 with a very, very small amount of carbon-13? Do we understand where matter was created? Do we understand where helium, gold, iron, where they were created, okay? Which is very similar to the question I was asking. I was just telling you I'm going to ask a question where matter was created, and now I want to ask the same question about the different chemical elements. When they were created? Okay? I guess some of you know the answer, but let me kind of go through the, those one after another. Let us first the question, where was iron created? And iron was definitely created late in the universe. Iron is creating, as we talk, in center of stars. Okay? So what happened? We understand that <coughs> basically stars start basically with just hydrogen and helium and in the process of burning the nuclear fission, they be kind of creating hev hev heavier and heavier elements, and this process stops at iron. Iron is what we call is the most bounded ele element, and the process of nuclear fission, that you take light elements and make heavier and heavier elements, happen inside stars, it happens inside our sun, and it stops at iron. And the reason that iron is so abundant is basically because it stops at iron. So basically, all the stars when they get to iron, they <coughs> die. Some of them explode, and the exploding of the stars, they get the iron out of their system, okay? And then, you know, come those second generation stars and collect them. And then the second generation stars collide, and we are what we call a third generation star. So the sun is believed to be a third generation star. There was two rounds of uh, things, and I think it was Carl Sagan, also from Cornell, that he uh, said this, that we are all um, uh, <coughs> stardust, stardust, thank you. We are all stardust because basically all the heavy elements in our body were created inside stars, okay? One important thing that happened inside star is the star is in a process that we call in equilibrium. What does it mean? The star actually is in an equilibrium state. You know, something are created, something are going out, and that's why stars can actually burn for so long, like the sun, we believe that the sun is a star that's going to burn for about 10 billion years. It's already halfway through. It's about 5 billion years that is burning, and uh, we think that we have another 5 billion years in the bank, so we are not worried too much about it. So one reason is that we have kind of an equilibrium process. Okay, so we all know where iron. What about the heavier element, elements that are heavier than iron? For example, gold. Okay, we all care about gold. Where gold was created. Gold cannot be created inside star. The reason is that gold, actually, <coughs> you need energy in order to take iron and make gold, okay? So to create gold, I keep emitting energy. And that's not going to happen inside star. And it's still an open question. However, very recently, we got a big indication of what's going on here. And you may have heard about the famous collider of two neutron stars that was detected by the LIGO collaboration. And they saw something that we call a kilonova. And one big result of this kilonova is that we think that iron is actually, not iron, that gold is creating inside this kilonova. And what we think going on 
is that it's a process that is what we call out of equilibrium. Things are created gold, but then the gold have no time to create iron. Inside, inside the sun, you can create a little bit of gold, but then the gold immediately like to go down and release more energy to create iron. In the kilonova, there's no time for the iron to actually do it, okay? And that's what we call an out of equilibrium process, a process that there's no time to the process actually to finish what it does, and there's no time for the anti-process to actually happen. So it's still kind of an open question, but we made a lot of progress on this one. Where well, helium was created. Most of the helium that we see around us was created in the Big Bang. There was no star, the helium doesn't have to actually happen inside stars. The helium was created in the Big Bang, and this story of creating of helium in the Big Bang go under the name of Big Bang nucleosynthesis, nucleosynthesis of synthesizing the nuclear. And actually, we think that in the early universe, basically five elements were created in the Big Bang. These are the hydrogen, this is the what we call helium-4, this is helium-3, which is an isotope of helium, this is deuterium-2, which is an isotope of uh, hydrogen, and lithium-7. Okay? And just to give you the number, this was about 75% of the universe after the Big Bang was helium, it was hydrogen, 25% was helium, helium-3 was about 1 per 10,000, deuterium was also about 1 per 10,000, and lithium was about 1 per billion. Okay? That was, and all other elements were basically zero after the Big Bang. So I'm not going to get all the details. It's a really, really cool and interesting calculation. And all those calculations depend on one number. Okay? This one number is the density of matter at the time that this happened. So people actually did all the calculation, and they were able to measure five densities as a function of only one number, which tells you I can actually determine this one number. And it works, okay? We find five numbers out of one parameter. That's how we test physics, when you have non-trivial prediction, okay? If you have one input parameter and you can measure five things, that's a non-trivial prediction. And what we find out is the following. This happened, the, the time that this all happened was in the first three minutes of the universe. So we actually know that at the first three minutes of when the universe was three minutes old, there was already no antimatter around us. It's a result of this calculation. So we know that matter was created in the first three minutes. Okay? We have good reason to believe that it happened much, much earlier, okay? probably at 10 to the minus 20 seconds, but we are not sure. What we're sure is that it was happening in the first three minutes. Okay? It's also determined the density of matter. So not only that I was telling you, so, so far I was telling you like, there's just matter in the universe, but we know more. We know how much matter there is in the universe. And the average density of, the universe, of matter in the universe is about one proton or one baryon per five cubic feet, which is roughly speaking one proton per, per volume of a person. Okay? So on average in the universe, you have take your body and replace your body with one proton. That's how you fill up the universe on average. Okay? And <laughs> the other thing that we know, we only know from this calculation, we only know the baryon density. We know there's more baryon than antibaryon. We don't know about the leptons. So from now on, when I say about matter creation, I only talk about baryon creation, not antibaryon. How was matter created? So we know where it was created in the first three minutes. And now we're going to talk about a little bit of how. And here I'm not going to give you a really good answer. They say this is where this open question is. So I'm going to make a little detour into something else in physics, which is called conservation law, okay? And conservation law play a huge deal in physics. Again, anybody who took any physics class, you know it, right? The teacher come, I really remember it, ninth grade, the teacher said, say, there's something called energy conservation. That means that energy cannot be created or annihilate, okay? And she said that's very important because it's going to help you to solve the question for the exam. It's actually more important than that, okay? It's not just for solving a question. And then you learn about momentum conservation and about angular momentum conservation and about charge conservation. Charge cannot be created or annihilated, okay? And this conservation law tells us a lot of things. For example, it tells us things about decays. So if I have decay, like alpha decay, I know that the particle that go out in alpha decay 
must satisfy the fact that the charge of the two particles that go out is equal to the charge of what decays. That's the whole point of conservation. When I have, okay, the same is beta and gamma decay. I also know that the mass and energy should be conserved. And we know that mass and energy are kind of the same from E equal mc squared, okay? So conservation law actually tell us what can happen and what cannot happen. So I cannot actually have a particle that carry charge to decay to something that cannot decay every charge because of charge conservation. Because if I have something that have charge and decay to something that doesn't, charge is not conserved. Okay? So conservation law are very important to tell us what can happen and what cannot happen in the universe. So now let's ask the following question. Why is the electron stable? Why the electron doesn't decay? Say, so, well, obviously, the electron is the lightest ne negatively charged particle. So there's not, nothing it can decay to. Because in order for decay to something, this something has to be lighter than what you start. And we have many, many, not many, but quite a lot of other negatively charged particles, and they eventually decay into electrons. We have the muon, we have the tau, we have the pion. You name it, there's a particle with this letter that decay eventually to an electron. And you say, so why the proton is not decaying? You say, well, because it's the lightest char positively charged particle. That's what you could say before Dirac. However, when Dirac finds that there's actually a lighter particle that the proton could decay to, which is the positron. So now we are kind of stuck. We say, why can't we have the proton to decay into two positron and an electron? What forbids this thing? Okay? It's conserved charge. Here is plus one, plus, 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 minus is plus one. The proton is heavier than those three, so it can decay. Okay? Angular momentum is satisfied. Everything is satisfied. There's no reason for this not to happen. Oops, problem. Why it's a problem? Because we don't see the proton decay, luckily, right? If the proton would decay, you know, we would like all of us immediately become electrons. <laughs> you know, it's nice, but we prefer to have some protons in us. So what is the solution? The solution is really, really nice solution. We say, let's invent a new thing that is conserved, okay? And this new thing we call baryon number. And how this baryon number is conserved? We say, let's give the proton and the neutron a charge, a new charge. It's not electric charge, it's something else. We call it a baryonic charge, OK? And the proton and the neutron have baryonic charge of plus one. The antiproton and the antineutron have baryonic charge of minus one, because they are antiparticles. And the electron have no baryonic charge. And therefore, the proton cannot decay. Very nice. It's such a cool idea, right? You just don't see something, and everything is allowed. OK, so, you know, in a way, you feel like the government, you impose, say, oh, I don't want you to do it, I impose a new law. So you impose a new conservation law. You say, hey, until now, you could park here. Now, no, there's new rules. You cannot do it anymore. You cannot decay the proton story. There's a new conservation law. Nobody order it. The only reason that you invent this conservation law is to make the proton stable, OK? That's the correct answer. Okay? We know that's done long ago, and now we understood really, really where it's coming from. The standard model, it's actually emerged, and it's understand it's much deeper. This was the initial idea, and now we understand that actually it's come from much, much deeper principles, and we understand it. Okay, so that's bring us to the question, the following. Okay? So I just told you that baryon number keeps the proton stable, since it's applied that the proton cannot be destroyed or created without an antiproton. Because baryon number is the lightest thing. You, when you have a proton and you want to kill it, you have to come with an antiproton to kill it. On the other hand, if the proton, carry, it's, if the proton cannot be created without an antiproton, how can we make a, a universe that's made out of protons? You see the problem. The problem is, if you think about baryon number just like it's charge, I tell you on one hand, a proton must come with something that conserves its charge, something that has the, the, the opposite charge to annihilate it. But on the other hand, we see that at the end of the day, the universe has a total charge of baryon. The universe is charged under baryon. Right. Okay, let's do a little other detour. And let me talk a little bit about alche alchemy. This I say it correctly? I'm not sure. Al hmm? Alchemy? Alchemy. This I know how to say the ha. Alchemy. Okay? <laughs> so what is the story of alchemy? Okay? Back then, in the middle, in the... Um, I don't know when it was done, but long ago, okay, long ago, uh, it was 
People said, you know, why can't we actually make, iron, make gold? Let's take some iron and lead, put in something together and get out as uh, gold. And it's never worked, OK? Alchemy didn't work. Why alchemy didn't work, OK? Well, in the modern sense of say, we say it doesn't work because there must be a conservation law that forbids it, right? That's, I was just telling you, everything is allowed unless it is forbidden. It's forbidden by some law, OK? And the law has to be conservation law. So what is the conservation law that forbids alchemy? And we call it the conservation of elements, OK? In chemistry, elements cannot be created or annihilated. If you have chemistry and you start with one mole of carbon, you end up with one mole of carbon. And it's okay if the carbon comes together with the oxygen and makes CO2 and whatever, but the number of carbon is conserved. Carbons cannot be created or annihilated. However, we know that E equal MC squared. This is a very famous equation. Everybody saw it before, I'm, I'm sure. There's an unwritten rule that when you give public talks, that's the only equation you're allowed to write, okay? Because <laughs> everybody knows it. And that's actually a very important thing. It tells us the energy and mass can be exchanged. So actually, if you go to high enough energy, or in other way, to high enough temperature, you can actually create gold. And we are creating gold. Actually, to tell you the truth, at CERN, we are destroying gold. We take gold, run it in the uh, ring, bump it into each other, and it disappears. Okay? And that's not the most expensive thing. Okay? <laughs> We know we do it, again, on, on a daily basis. We are actually <coughs> killing gold. What is going on? So alchemy actually works at high temperature. Only at low temperature, alchemy doesn't work. This idea of the conservation of element is what we call is just an approximation of a conservation. It's a conservation law only at low temperature. At high temperature, it's not there anymore. Okay? So we actually find a very interesting kind of a conservation law. Unlike energy or momentum that we believe they are conserved at any temperature, there are some conservation laws that are conserved only at low temperature. And that's, for example, of alchemy. Okay? There's some conservation law, the conservation of elements that is there only at uh, low energy. How this is actually relevant to what we are doing? So soon we're going to understand how this is actually something similar happened to us when we talk about biogenesis. So now let me move and discuss what are really the conditions to actually have biogenesis. That is, what really has to happen in the universe in order for the universe to actually made out of bions and not antibodies. And this is Andrei Sakharov. He got the Nobel Prize for peace. Okay, he was uh, in the Soviet Union and Besides the fact that he was working really a lot of human rights and peace, he was also an amazing physicist. And some kind of way I want to say, you know, between one trip to Sibir and another trip to Sibir, he made amazing breakthrough in, in physics. One breakthrough that you might heard about the cosmic microwave background, and you see, and there was a prediction that they actually have some kind of wiggles. He was the first person who actually understood that we should see these wiggles and now we saw them much after he died. And the other thing, he was the first person to even ask the question. So the question that I was pre telling you, that this is the question of my talk today, where the antimatter, he was the first person who asked, and he asked this question in 1967, okay? And not only did he ask this question, he kind of gave a general answer to the question. And these answers go under the name of the Sakharov condition, okay? And Sakharov said, we must have any, if you want a, a, a universe that's made out of matter, we need three conditions to be satisfied. The first condition is that bio number is not conserved. Okay? Because if bio number is conserved, we just say we cannot have more bions than antibions because they are mirror image of each other exactly. However, we know that bio number must be conserved because otherwise the proton would have decayed. So how do we solve the problem? Just like alchemy. Okay? We say Bio number at low temperature, bio number is good, but at high temperature is not. And when bions were created in the early universe, it was very, very hot. Okay? It was much hotter than the center of the sun. Okay? And maybe at this temperature, bio number is not conserved. Okay? So we learn, just by putting things together, we learn 
The baryon number is this interesting conservation law. It's different than charge, okay? It's more like conservation of elements that we have in chemistry. So that was one condition. The other condition is that matter and antimatter cannot be exact mirror images. Because if they were exact mirror images, okay, even if I can create baryons, I can also create antibaryons with the same rate. So there must be something that tells that they are not the same. Okay? So the Dirac equation that I was telling you cannot be the end of the story. The, must, the Dirac equation, again, should be just an approximation, and it should be something deeper than the Dirac equation. Okay? And the third condition is that this cannot be in equilibrium. You remember we talked about iron and gold and the difference between how they are producing, and gold are created out of equilibrium? Same must happen for baryons. If it happens in equilibrium, then the same process that creates baryons, I will have also the same process that annihilate and destroy baryons. So it must happen out of equilibrium. And this list of three conditions is the full list. And any way that we could actually have a, a universe of baryons must have all these very interesting kind of ingredients. Okay? We must have some baryon number that is good at low energy and not good at high energy. This mirror image of meta and antimatter are not exact. And for some reason, things are not in equilibrium sometimes in the early universe. So, in the very beginning of the talk, I was telling you about our model that, you know, we should call it something else, called the standard model that explains a lot of things. So what you want to do, you want to go to your model that explains so many things, and you go and calculate. You say, could I actually have it? Can I have baryon number violation at high temperature? And the answer is yes. Very, very interesting phenomena, very theoretical. But I'm telling you that baryon number, the thing that makes the proton stable, it's correct only at low temperature. When you go to high temperature, we theoretically know that there's actually something that makes this conservation law broken. Nice. The second condition is antimatter is not an exact mirror image of matter. I told you the Rilac equation tells that it is. But then we actually study to details the weak interaction, the wind that the thing that actually gives beta decays. And in a very non-trivial way, just because we have three generations of particles and some other very, very non-trivial things, we find that actually the standard model tells us that bion and antibions, uh, that matter and antimatter are not exactly the same. And I spend Probably a huge amount of my career is actually just asking this question, what is the difference between matter and antimatter in the standard model? And we understood it, okay? The Nobel Prize was given in 2008, and usually when a Nobel Prize is given, that says we understood it, okay? <clears throat> and in the early universe, there was an epoch of something that went out of equilibrium. And again, we don't really know what's happened, but we do the calculation, and we found that there was actually a good reason to believe that in the early universe, there was some thing that went out of equilibrium. Sounds kind of nice. There was the three conditions, and now that we understood everything, we understood the weak interaction, we understood some very non-trivial other facts of the universe, we actually find a system that have more bions than antibions. What left to be done is just to calculate the number. I told you we need like one atom per human body. What come out to be the number? And we are off. We are numerically off by about mere 20 order of magnitudes. Okay? So you do the calculation, and you find that the standard model predicts that we have about one proton per moon volume, rather than per person volume. Although the moon looks so small, it's actually big. Okay? So we are missing by 20 order of magnitude, and that's kind of the way I feel. Okay? You, should have seen something, maybe. No, but soccer has become much more popular in America. Maybe I should have uh, do some baseball. But, you know, you play soccer. You go, you go, you pass the defender, pass the defender, pass the defender, pass the goalie, come in, yes, and you are like one meter from the goal line, and boom, you go above, okay, and you miss it. It's so, so, so no trivial, the fact that we actually have a universe that's made out of matter in our model, in our standard model. And you really so close, and you just miss by 20 order of magnitude. I mean, <laughs> OK? So that's the feeling. You kind of understood a lot, a lot, but not everything is there. So what are we learning? What are we learning out of all this? OK? So we know something about the unknown. So we know 
that there's open question. The open question is this fact that our model cannot explain the data. And it cannot explain the data numerically, not fundamentally. Numerically, it doesn't explain the data. So we kind of feel that we are in the right direction, but we don't fully understand what is going on. So we know that there must be something new. Some new particles should be around that have some new interaction, OK? And we know that this new particle must satisfy this thing that I was telling you, that is violet bio number conservation at high temperature, but not at low temperature. Yes, that was, I was all the story that I was telling you. And <clears throat> we know that they provide bigger difference between meta and antimeter, because the one that we already observe is just not enough. We are off by 20 order of magnitude. So the differences between meta and antimeter is bigger than what we saw, we thought. Okay? Another way to, to say it is that let's say that you take two twins and you look at them and you say, wow, I see a difference. Okay? For one twin, actually, you know, this tooth is a little bit more to the left. Okay? But there must be more changes. And those changes maybe internally you say, oh, there's actually much more. So we probably what we see, we see the difference in meta and antimeter only on the surface, and it's a deeper, at shorter distances, there's more difference between meta and antimeter. Okay? So we don't know what is the answer, but we know properties of the answer. Okay? And in that way, we, are made, we made progress since Sakharov. Okay? We know a lot of how this is, can be done, but we don't know what it is. There's many ideas how to do it. Okay? There's many ideas on the market, and then bring me back to my basically very first transparency that I told you that when we have an open question, we usually have Many answers, not one, okay? One answer that is extremely interesting, go under the name of GATT, not this one. It stands for Grand Unified Theory, okay? And Grand Unified Theory is actually the idea that the strong interaction, the weak interaction, and the electromagnetic interaction are all combined into one, okay? Another idea called leptogenesis. It has to do with the idea that actually all this baryon asymmetry that we see come eventually from properties of neutrinos, which looks like an ex a whole different story, but this looks very, very attractive in a sense that it makes a lot of sense and there's a lot of indirect evidence that that's maybe the correct one. Something called supersymmetry, you may have heard about it, okay? If not, that's good because now you heard about it, okay? And this may be a solution to this. What we are looking, we have to look and check it, okay? So that's how we are making progress in physics. Say, we have an open question, we have many possible solutions, Tell me how I can actually go and experimentally go and check it, okay? And there's actually quite a lot of really cool ones. Proton decay. So those different things predict that the proton is unstable. We will talk about the fact that it's kind of stable, but maybe it's have a very, very, very long lifetime. And as of now, we know that the proton lifetime is <coughs> about 24 order of magnitude longer than the age of the universe. But maybe the proton live 30 order of magnitude longer than the age of the universe. So how can we actually look for proton decay? All you have to do is take many, many, many protons and wait. Okay? So that's what we are doing. Okay? You take water, you put it in a big tank. Okay? You put some detectors on the tank, and you wait. You wait for 40 years. You didn't see anything. In the meantime, you detect or detect neutrino oscillation, you get a Nobel Prize, you detect this. So you get some Nobel Prize from the side, but you're still waiting for the proton to decay. Okay? That's called Super Kamiokanda. And I'm really looking forward for the announcement. Maybe we will see it. Okay? There's, again, it's a very, very interesting test, and we are looking to see if the proton is going to decay. We look for very rare beta decays. Okay? There's some beta decays that happen that are extremely rare, and we are looking for them. We didn't see them yet, OK? We not yet have the sensitivity to see them where we want to see. So what we need, we just need bigger detectors and bigger materials, OK, to look for those rare beta decays. Hopefully, in 10, 20 years, we will be able to see those rare beta decays. And if we see them, we can say, oh, that looks much more likely than this, OK? So we're actually going to say something about those things, OK? We look at colliders. We look at the LHC. Okay, and we can actually look for some signal at the LHC that tell us something about this question. So far, we didn't see much. Okay? But that's why we are still in the stage of an open question. We are open question in a sense. We have many ideas, but we don't know which is the correct one. 
So that's bring me to my conclusion, and let me just say that there's still so much to explore, and I'm looking forward to come here in 20 years and tell you the answer. Thank you. <laughs>
and they go around and then there was one that survived, okay? Everybody has annihilated, okay? So that was the story. The story, we have both meta and anti -meta, and when things cool down, they annihilate, and we are the leftover. We are the lucky ones, the 10 to the minus 10. Blue and then red. I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a member. Uh, besides the LIGO experiment, what other kinds of things can people look at to get some more answers on antimatter? Oh, so actually LIGO is one of the <coughs> questions that we are not particularly actually sensitive to the question of antimatter. And I understand your question is looking at the sky, if there's any antimatter in the sky. And we are looking for other experiments that look for gamma rays. In particular, it's something that's called the Fermi. A satellite and they, this Fermi satellite actually look for gamma rays from the sky and they don't see those. And there's other things that actually look for gamma rays from the sky and we don't see that and that's why we think. There's few, we actually see antimatter coming from the sky directly by positrons and antiprotons and I was telling you that was Anderson yeah. the way he found it. And there's actually some kind of indication that maybe there's more antimatter than we should. None of this is conclusive, okay? but we look into gamma rays from the sky and directly into positrons and antiprotons from the sky. So we have red over here, then blue, and then the blue can go to Rudy. Thanks. Uh, my name is Jim McCormick, and I'm a member. I have to check my dues. Um, you mentioned supersymmetry as a possible answer for why baryogenesis. Yes. Many of us watched the movie Particle Fever. Yes. Particle Fever presented a choice between supersymmetry and multiverse. What happens to baryogenesis if we find multiverse is the answer? <laughs> yeah, because David is here, you know, the director of the movie. So I want any sorry, don't, 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 don't reflect the question for me. Uh, so actually, so actually let, let, me, let me make the following. Uh, I really didn't get into the full details of what supersymmetry is, and it's not that supersymmetry is going to solve it. It's a one very specific version of supersymmetry that can solve this question. Some other version has nothing to say about this, but it's, it's much bigger. And the same with the multiverse. The multiverse is not just one, here is a specific model. It's more of a framework with an idea. And within those ideas, we actually can have some solution into this uh, thing. So <coughs> again, it's, it's go deeper. In, at the end of the day, if we will see, you know, if you want to see, oh, it's super symmetry, we want to see, we want to see it in actually several different places. It's blue over here. Yeah. Uh, my name is Bittal. I'm not a member. Um, whenever you get a problem and you can't answer that, you introduce one more variable and then say whatever that variable is would, would solve the problem. Uh, my question is, where did these charges come from. Um, uh, when, when we call electron has negative charge, positron has a positive charge. If uh, matter is a compact compaction of energy, then where did this charge come from for an electron? So to, to answer you to the, the simpler answer is as following. So if I take pure energy and I want to say, oh, this pure energy can create charge, it must create the same amount of positive and negative charge. And we see it all the time. So the way we see it, we take things that have no charge which are just pure energy, and this pure energy can become an electron and positron in a way that they, it has exactly the same amount of electron and positron. Okay, that's what we are able to see. And in the early universe, everything was pure energy, and it was created such that the amount of electron is exactly the same as the amount of proton. And while we don't know it exactly, we have a very, very, very good reasons to believe that the number of the electron and the number of proton in the universe is exactly the same. Okay, so when we say where charge coming from is the usual thing. When you have something that is overall zero, you can have positive and negative, right? You go to your bank account that is zero, you take out money, you have positive money in your hand, and you have negative money in the bank. So the total is still zero, but you see money here, okay? It's the same story. You take electron from here, and you get positron somewhere else. No, 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 no. No dialogue. You, you can raise your hand, and the mic come back to you. You can ask the question. All right. So we have a blue mic over here. And oh, wait, wait, we, got, we forgot no. this red one. Red oh, actually, I'm trying to straighten out a little problem with the blue mic over here, because there are a whole bunch of people who had their hand up. So we'll get to you, but we're going to go to this one over here, and then to Rudy, and then to you. So uh, You discussed the inflationary period, and I had the impression that you that kind of... Tell us your name? Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm Dan Junker. I'm not a member. 
uh, you discussed the inflationary period. And the impression I got was that kind of erased the chalkboard and made everything kind of uniform. Could you elaborate on that? It always seemed a little bit hokey to me when I heard about the inflationary period. How does it fit so well? Uh, so we don't fully understand, OK? This is definitely an open question in physics. It's another open question in physics is the period of inflation. But we have a lot, a lot of indirect evidence to understand that that's what's happened, OK? And those indirect evidence has to do with the fact that we see the universe as extremely homogeneous on very large scales. We see the universe in a very specific density of matter and antimatter and dark energy. When you combine them together, it's come to a number that is very, very precisely predicted by inflation. Okay? In some units, it's one, and we measure it to be one to a very good accuracy through some different measurements. Okay? So we kind of know what it is, and I the best I have, the intuition is that, okay? It's basically, you kind of take what you have and then you go and there's nothing else. It's basically just like the government printing new money, okay? Again, I just can tell you what I remember as a kid. In Israel, we had a currency, it's called the lira, and then within a few years, it was nothing, and then they say, oh, let's produce a new one called shekel and we start from scratch. That's basically the same story. And it's happened also in the universe that somehow, the space-time expand, and if you had a proton here or there, it completely disappeared. The, diff the distance between two protons, that were, if, if two protons were very close to each other before inflation, now the distance is more than the observed universe, so it's completely irrelevant. And I don't have a better explanation. I mean, I, <laughs> I have a lot of formula that I can write and I can explain, but I don't have a, you know, it, it's not so easy to come with explanation. And, as always, you know, also many of the things I was telling you now, you know, I was kind of round corners, let's put it that way. Rudy, then Dale. Uh, and we yeah, have so the, I, green, the microphone my, up here, Al. Can we have the green microphone up here? Okay, Rudy. Uh, my name's Rudy Krutar, and I am a lapsed member. I want to fix that somehow, but uh, we'll see. And um, I have one question. What's the matter? <laughs> You need to answer that question before you can uh, answer where's the antimatter. Yes. And, and we have, in the standard model, we have this notion that uh, four particles are all matter and their antiparticles are antimatter. And that, that's kind of silly because in my calculations, the hydrogen atom is totally balanced between matter and antimatter. So there's no question of that. So it, the, the way they've defined matter, it does not obey a conservation law. So, so what I really want to, and I, I kind of, I was kind of mentioning in the in the talk, is that I really ask the question, where is the baryon versus antibody? I'm not asking the question where matter versus antimatter, and we really don't know if there's more matter than antimatter. Okay, and you can totally define the electron to be antimatter, and then you are completely right that we can have a universe made out of no matter at all. The real question is where are the baryons versus antibaryons? Okay, and we know that there's proton and neutron and there's no antiproton and antineutron. And that's really the question we are asking. So you're completely right. Where? We actually don't Where? know if we have more matter than antimatter in the universe. What we do know is that we have more baryons than antibaryons. And that's really the question. But again, as a popular lecture, I, give, I call it matter versus baryon. But this delicate difference and this baryon is a new world. But, uh, but yes, you to see that. Al, there's some, somebody over here who has a question. Right here. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. My name is Dale Doucette. I'm a member. My question has to do with the colliders. Would you list the major ones, where they are, and what particular research they are involved in? <laughs> it's all lecture by itself. Okay, let me say the following. Try Wikipedia. One bigger one is the one at CERN, it's in Geneva. At CERN, it's called the LHC. And they produce, they actually take proton on proton and they collide proton and proton on energy. <coughs> it's about <coughs> much, much bigger than the mass of the proton and they create a lot of other particles. And there we can learn something else. There's several other colliders. Let me tell one that I'm extremely excited about. And that's other collider called KK, and that's in Japan. And it's running an experiment that is called Bell 2. And since it's called Bell 2, you could guess that there was an experiment called Bell 1. And Bell 1 was actually a very successful experiment that answered a lot of those questions, which is the difference between 
meter and antimeter in the standard model. And this was the reason that we understood. And now Bell 2 is going to be the same idea. They basically take electron and positron and collide it. Okay? But they collide it such that the center of mass of the system is not at rest. The electron has more energy than the positron. So the whole system, the rest of mass of the system, is actually going in that way. And by doing this little trick, they can measure a lot, a lot of very, very interesting things. And this new experiment is already have beams. And within a few weeks, we're going to see the first collision of those. And within a year, we should start getting results from this experiment. So this is an experiment that I'm extremely excited about seeing coming online. And it's very directly going to address the question that I was discussing today. Okay? Let's keep it that way, because otherwise, I, you know, I can go for two. Just point. List us the major colliders. I think that's a little beyond the scope of today's talk. List the major colliders. Seven. And yeah. KK. Five of them or six? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's actually a, a lot of colliders, and they actually go for different directions. So, if you ask what are the major colliders for answering this question, these days two that I was mentioning. Blue microphone, please. My name is Al Ehrlich. I am a member. Um, back when I learned about positrons early on, I learned that. If it has enough energy, a high energy gamma ray can decay into a positron and an electron. But for that to happen, it has to happen in the vicinity of a, heavy, a massive particle in order to conserve both energy and momentum. So at the Big Bang, if there were no particles, how are you? The only way I can conceive of, and you tell me whether this is right or wrong, to to create matter and antimatter is for it to happen in, in interactions inv involving more than one creation of the pair at a time. So, so the way we think about it is basically that was this inflation, and this when we went out of inflation, the way that going out of inflation is by creating a lot, a lot of particle and antiparticles, okay? And you create all of them. And that's because it was kind of what we call thermal equilibrium. And a little more formally, there must be a new field. We call it the inflaton field. We don't know what it is. We just know that it must be there. And this inflaton field is what decay into electron and positron. OK? So it's not only photon can decay into electron and positron in the vicinity of matter. It's this inflaton field. We don't know what it is. There's actually a lot of ideas just like this. It's an open question. We have a lot of ideas. And we know something about the unknown. And there's something that we know about the unknown, that there's something that looks like a new field that we call the inflaton. Thank you. Yeah, I would remind the people with the microphones to look for people with their hands up. There's one right there next to you. Would you give him the mic, please? He has simple questions that are impossible uh, yeah, to answer. Yeah, Joe Powers again. Um, I, this is more broad, and, and so I guess it's the, the real question is clear up my understanding about this, but a lot of these experiments on antimatter compare anti-hydrogen to hydrogen, but it seems to me like the actual question that you should be studying is to compare the difference between anti-hydrogen and anti-deuterium to the difference in matter between hydrogen and deuterium. And you just don't, because you can't, because it's hard to keep an anti-neutron from finding something to decay to. So is that right, or, or what is the misunderstanding that says that experiment is actually worthless? So, you know, ideally if we could create an anti-deuterium, that would be an extremely interesting thing. Anti-deuterium is still not in the cards as of now. We don't know how to create it. But actually, the point is that any antimatter that we can actually create, we're going to study the difference in matter and antimatter. And in, at CERN, we actually study the difference in hydrogen and anti-hydrogen because it's matter versus antimatter. And I told you that in the standard model, we already know that matter and antimatter are not the same. But it was not done with electron and positron. It was done with other particles. In particular, we saw difference between matter and antiparticles and antimatter in only two kinds of particles. One of them they call kaons, and the other of them they call B meson or beauty meson. Okay? And there where we found it. So in the, to answer your question, we only look for all our possibilities. Everything that we have a, par, a, a particle and an antiparticle, and we can study them, we study their differences. Okay? And we have good reason to, and now we understand why we saw it only in kaon and bion and B, but we didn't see it in hydrogen. And if we could create anti deuterium yes, we go and study it. Okay? It's basically what we could create. Okay? So he's right. 
<laughs> yes. We don't do the experiment because we can't do the experiment yet. It would be really. I think we'll end with that question and uh, want to thank you before you go uh, by presenting you with a framed copy of the announcement of your talk and a signed copy of volume one of the Bulletin of the Philosophical Society of Washington, which actually is more interesting than you might imagine. <laughs> so I get something interesting to read. Yeah, it talks about the scientific problems of the day, which are eerily similar to those that we face now. And it also explains why they called it the Philosophical Society and lists who the original members were. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Talk. And before we go, yes, before we go, just a few closing announcements. Not sure what they are, but there are a few closing announcements. All right, first of all, if you're not a member, please join. It's easy to do. You go to our website, www.bswscience.org. And on the first page, on the left-hand side, you'll see a... <clears throat> I have to, you'll see a, a list, and there's a button, and the button will get you to our website. Yeah, what do you know? I actually got it up. We've had a lot of technical problems today. All right, so membership. Membership application is here. It pulls up the application. Fill it out, submit the form, go to the payment page and donate. You don't have to donate with PayPal. I'm not supposed to beat this dead horse, but a lot of people had problems. They thought they had to use PayPal. You don't. You can just use a debit or credit card of your choice. <clears throat> PSW is a 501c3 organization under the Internal Revenue Code, and your contributions are tax deductible to the extent that the current Internal Revenue Code allows you to deduct things. Our next lecture and the 2393rd meeting will take place on May 4 right here in the Powell Auditorium. And the speaker will be Thomas Budavari, Professor of Applied Mathematics and Statistics at Johns Hopkins University. Thomas works on integrating very large independently developed data sets, including large astronomical data sets. He is applying the statistical and computational methods he developed for astronomy to the integration analysis and use of city data sets, such as water use, electrical consumption, road repair, demographic data, and the like, to develop more accurate and complete understanding of land use patterns to guide policy formation and implementation, particularly in Baltimore, our northern neighbor. And then on either May 18th or June 15th, probably June 15th, we'll have a special panel our series of, discussion, of presentations on Cassini, and more on that as we make the moons align for this. <laughs> We've been through uh, a series of scheduling conflicts and difficulties, but Mark here in the front row, now that test is safely on its way, will no doubt have lots more time to help us put the rest of the schedule together. Right, Mark? <laughs> And with that, I will entertain a motion from a member to adjourn the meeting to the social hour. Nobody wants to adjourn? Yuval, can you continue lecturing? No. <laughs> I have a motion up here. Do we have a second? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Meeting is adjourned to the social hour. <laughs>